hire services, ranch owners, those with large families, or those who tow small mountains, pay attention. This comparison is for you. We've gathered four of the best large body-on-frame SUVs currently on sale. These big boys excel at hauling cargo, families, and sizable trailers. But more than that, these top trim models are crammed full of luxury, technology, and comfort. So we are going to spend the day driving these four big full-size SUVs to find out which one is the best. So let's get to it. We start with the new beast on the block. Now, I have to mention right away that this is actually a pre-production version of the Toyota Sequoia Capstone. Capstone is Toyota's new top trim in its truck lineup. It's sort of their Denali or Platinum, except they already have a Platinum, uh, so maybe not like that. Either way, as a prototype, it's really hard to tell that it is that, except for the big giant sticker over here on the dashboard. Most of the surfaces are coated in this squishy, soft, cream or black leather, and it's honestly a really nice place to spend time. You know, as first impressions go, this tuxedo style color scheme does a lot of things right. The good vibes continue the first time that you match the throttle. The Sequoia shares its platform with the Tundra pickup, and it borrows that truck's excellent 3.4 liter turbo V6 hybrid powertrain. It's standard in the Sequoia, and it produces a test best 437 horsepower. Not only that, but it has an absolutely mountainous 583 pound-feet of torque. So even though this is five pounds shy of being the heaviest SUV in this comparison, it really does move. The 10-speed auto is also a good match. So even better, the Sequoia still has the best fuel economy numbers here, posting an average of 20 miles per gallon combined, which is 11.7 liters per 100 kilometers for our Canadian viewers. It's even got a pretty solid rumble from this uh, Turbo V6. Eh? So Mike isn't much of a fan of that, considering this is ostensibly a family vehicle, but uh, I kind of like it. Unfortunately, the move back to a live rear axle and the lack of air suspension does make for a busy ride. Even the slightest brush of the brakes has the nose tipping forward, which sort of saps driver confidence. And that's when this thing is empty. Can you imagine when it's towing close to its max of 8,980 pounds? The previous generation Sequoia was almost old enough to get its driver's license, and it had an infotainment system to match. Luckily, this new one is pretty sweet. Borrowed from the Tundra, it's got a big screen, sharp graphics, and speedy responses. Like the GMC, it's a Google-based system, and so it runs with a simple menu on the left-hand side. Also, just like the GMC, it has wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto standard. Toyota crams a lot of comfort and convenience features into the Sequoia. A head-up display, a fully digital instrument panel, panoramic roof, power tailgate, 22-inch alloy wheels, those sorts of things are expected. But to be the only model in this test to have second row ventilated seats, that's impressive, especially once you stop and consider that this is also the least expensive model here. Vehicles this big are designed for the second row passengers as much as those in front. Unfortunately for the Sequoia, it finished last in this category. It's the only one that doesn't have a sliding second row seat that allows you to go backwards and forward, and the roof really dips down right in front of the second row passenger's head. There's also a very large center tunnel, probably due to all of the hybrid battery technology. The Expedition offers a bit more seating flexibility and a flatter roof. It is still a bit close to my head, but there is more space. The seats themselves, they're good, but they're not great. The Yukon second row seats at first glance seem thin and unsupportive, but once sitting in them, they actually are quite comfortable. This also has the best panoramic sunroof in the test, and there's lots of space to move around in here. But the second row champ is the Wagoneer. Despite being the only one in the test with a bench seat, it's still the most comfortable place to sit, and all but the tallest of passengers will fit back here without issue. So let's talk more about the Wagoneer. Released last year, it fills a gap in Stellantis' lineup that's been there for a decade. That is a body-on-frame full-size SUV. It's based on the Ram pickup truck chassis, and the Wagoneer comes with a 5.7 liter V8, while the fancier Grand Wagoneer gets the larger 6.4 liter V8. 
The smaller Hemi makes close to 400 horsepower in the Wagoneer, but the least amount of torque. Since it has to haul around the heaviest vehicle we have on test, acceleration is a bit leisurely, but it is still a very smooth engine and makes a great V8 sound. Now before we start with the comments, we are aware that the 23 Wagoneer Series 2 comes with a new turbocharged 6 cylinder Hurricane engine. Unfortunately, at the time of our testing and filming, we could only get our hands on a 22 model with the V8. Now we have driven a 23 Wagoneer with that new engine, and it is a definite step up for this vehicle. So what about the rest of the vehicle? Well, in short, it is really, really good. The second and third row scored top marks in the test, an impressive feat for the second row considering this is the only vehicle with a bench seat, something that's usually not as comfortable. We like the overall design of the interior, and I really appreciate the padded armrest on the center console. The ride comfort in here can't be beat, as the Wagoneer stays smooth, flat, and rarely gets upset. A lot of this is thanks to the adjustable air suspension, which also makes the 6,000 pound vehicle handle okay. As tested, pricing for this Wagoneer Series 2 came in at just a few hundred dollars more than the lowest priced vehicle in the comparison, the Toyota Sequoia. Now to achieve this price, some options had to be skipped, like the towing package, which would have brought the as tested towing of just over 7,000 pounds up to almost 9,000 pounds to match the Ford Expedition. Still, there are a lot of great features in the vehicle, like a fully digital gauge cluster, 22 inch wheels, panoramic sunroof, and ventilated leather seats. All right, now it's time to visit Wayback Town. All of these things are roughly the size of a small loft, so an accommodating third row is kind of an important deal here. Uh, unfortunately, as you can see, this is another strike against the Toyota. Um, it's kind of a perfect storm of uncomfortableness. Uh, the seat cushion is really low to the ground, which means that your knees are right up at your chest, and there's not a lot of leg room. However, unlike the other vehicles, you can just slide back up to six inches, which does give you a lot more leg room, but you're still stuck with less than the others. Also, as you can see, headroom is a little tight. To the Toyota's credit though, you can easily fold up the second row seats, they tumble up and away so you can get back here. The other three SUVs are a lot closer to each other. The GMC Yukon is the fancy pantsiest space with these nice brown leather seats, but headroom is only okay and this chunky C-pillar combined with a small rear window do make it feel a little claustrophobic back here. Third row riders certainly won't feel shortchanged in the Expedition. Headroom's pretty okay and there's a good amount of leg room. The seats are supportive and comfy, except we do find that these headrests are a little low for our tastes. The C-pillar isn't quite as chunky as the GMC, and you also get more natural light from these larger windows. Just like the second row contest, it's the Wagoneer that noses ahead here. It might be shaped like a fridge on the outside, but it does make for a genuinely cozy and comfortable third row experience. There's this nice armrest, the window line is low, the C-pillar isn't enormous, and the seats are pretty high up and reasonably supportive. Topping it all off, you've got this third row moonroof that lets a lot of natural light in. It's the SUV you've seen at a thousand airport arrival sections. Yes, the Expedition is the oldest of this quartet, and yes, even in extended wheelbase, gussied up platinum trim, it doesn't draw attention quite like the others. That being said, look past the familiar face, and you can see why the Expedition is such a common sight on the roads. It just nails the big SUV fundamentals. And we do mean big. The Expedition Max adds 12 inches in length and nine inches in wheelbase over the regular model, which makes this the biggest rig of the bunch. Now you might think that that adds a lot of space for third row passengers, but outside of a tiny increase in third row headroom, all that space is going to extra cargo storage. And when you pair that with the highest tow rating of this quartet, you can see why the Expedition is such a great choice for people who need to tow a small village and all its associated things. The Ford has other admirable traits too. The EcoBoost 3.5 liter V6 is a powerful, smooth performer with a lot of low down torque that helps mask what is probably the lowest horsepower rating of this quartet. Not only that, but it has a smooth shifting 10 speed automatic. This is a unit that we've criticized before, most recently in the Mustang GT, but here it avoids a lot of the gear hunting that that car suffered from, and it keeps engine noise to a minimum. Not only that, but according to the official figures, this is one of the least thirsty engines out here, and it's the only one that runs on regular fuel. It might be the largest of the large, 
the Expedition doesn't feel any more unwieldy than the other SUVs in this competition. A quick look at the spec sheet shows that this is actually the lightest truck here, so that helps. What also helps is the continuously controlled damping suspension system, which uses a road preview to sort of prepare the suspension for the worst that the road can throw under those big wheels. The result is a car that can't quite match the air ride suppleness of the GMC or the Wagoneer, but it feels a lot more in control of its extremities than the sometimes bouncy Toyota. Ford recently dropped the Mach-E's big portrait-style infotainment system into the Expedition, and I'm a fan. It's a really easy to use system with clear, sharp graphics, and I really like the little volume knob that sticks out separate from it. Uh, importantly, it does keep all of the climate controls on the screen at all times, which is a nice bonus. And the wireless CarPlay is really great because it shows up on the top part of the screen, but never takes up the whole thing, so you still have access to the important controls all the time. Unfortunately, in this company, the Ford strengths just aren't strong enough. That it's the second priciest of this whole bunch also hurts its chances. That being said, if sheer acreage and towing capacity are your priorities, then the Expo remains a strong choice. And it'll fly under the radar the entire time it's working. The one area the Expedition does excel at is when it comes to carrying cargo. Being the largest vehicle here, it's no surprise that it can hold the most gear behind the third row of seats. And it and the Yukon are the only two vehicles that allow a rear glass to open independently from the liftgate. At the other end of the spectrum is the Toyota Sequoia. Seats up or down, it offers the least amount of cargo carrying space. It is still a big SUV, so you can put a lot of gear in. And to help make up for its lack of cargo carrying ability, there is this cool adjustable shelf that helps give you a little bit more flexibility. Splitting the difference between those two SUVs is the Wagoneer. With the seats up or down, it is in the middle when it comes to cargo carrying capability. One drawback though is the rear seats and the middle row don't have any buttons to fold, so it's more of a manual process in the Wagoneer. And that brings us to the anomaly, the Yukon. With the rear seats folded up, it's only third best when it comes to cargo, just beating the Sequoia. But fold down the second and third row, and suddenly cargo carrying capacity expands to best in test, even beating the large Expedition. GM's full-size SUVs have been a staple of this segment for decades. Those who wanted something a little fancier could always opt for the GMC Yukon Denali. Well, for 2023, there's an even more premium version called the Denali Ultimate. This takes an already impressive vehicle to another level. There's brown leather everywhere that is cross-stitched in the doors, center console, and the seats. The second and third row are power folding, and the front rows have built-in speakers in the headrest. Second row passengers each get an individual flat screen that has its own HDMI hookup. Other impressive features are the ventilated front seats, the 22-inch wheels, the panoramic sunroof, the fully digital gauge cluster, and the largest head-up display I think I've ever seen. The interior design scored second best in test and the quality of materials could not be beat. There are hard buttons everywhere which some may find overwhelming or cluttered, but we really appreciate that all the controls are right here and we don't have to dig through multiple menu screens to adjust some features. Powering the Denali is a 6.2 liter V8 that makes 420 horsepower and 460 pound-feet of torque on premium fuel. It is one of only two V8s in this test and makes more power than the Wagoneer or the Ford Expedition. Only the hybrid turbocharged Sequoia outguns it in terms of power. Response from the V8 is good, although it is missing that initial wave of torque found in a vehicle like the Ford Expedition. Overall though, we prefer this drivetrain. Like the Wagoneer, the Yukon Denali includes an adjustable air suspension that offers great ride comfort and surprisingly confident handling. The latter scored top marks in our comparison as the Yukon does the best at hiding its excessive weight. There's no question about it, this is the best vehicle in the test, but there's also a price to pay to get the best. As tested, it comes in at just over $97,000. That's about $16,000 more than the Wagoneer or the Sequoia. And then there's the fuel economy. That's pretty bad for the class and worst in this test. So it really comes down to a matter of, is the price for the Denali worth it? So after all the evaluating, testing, and scoring was done, we ended up with a tie, but not for first. The Toyota Sequoia and the GMC Yukon both ended up dead even for the runner-up position. The Yukon Denali features a superb drive, has high feature content and a premium interior, but it's held back by its fuel economy and price tag. The Toyota Sequoia 
is affordable, it's stylish, and it has a fantastic drivetrain, but it's held back by its ride quality and interior space. The Wagoneer Series 2 has none of those drawbacks. It's a smooth ride for all passengers, it's got tons of features, and it's barely more expensive than the Sequoia. It might be a newcomer in the segment, but right now, the Wagoneer is the best large SUV currently on sale.